Ladies and gentlemen, last time we talked about the Bolshevik victory over the White Army in the Russian Civil War, and we talked about the set of policies that uh, were adopted by the Bolshevik government between its uh, seizure of power in October 1917 and the end of the Civil War period. I pointed out that in this uh, phase of the Soviet state, the Bolshevik party consolidated its control over the leader, levers of power. I pointed out that so-called bourgeois democracy, that means the competing political parties in Russia, were suppressed by the Bolsheviks. I pointed out also that the war communist period that lasted from roughly the middle of 1918 to 1921 that this period saw increasingly aggressive efforts by the Bolsheviks to suppress the market and uh, capitalism in Russian society. The suppression took the form of the conscription of grain from the peasantry without payment. It took form uh, of the nationalization of the banking system, of private property, including people's homes in the cities. and. Uh, at the end of the war communist period, there was even talk in the government about whether money should be abolished. And of course, without money, one cannot have a market of any sort. At the very end of the lecture, I talked about the way that Lenin and the Bolsheviks reconfigured nationality policy uh, in the empire. They promised first self-determination, but then they define self-determination of nations in such a way as to uh, make real self-determination uh, to be a theoretical possibility. They, through the workers of individual uh, ethnic groups, uh, controlled those nations in a way that was actually uh, more far-reaching than imperial, uh, Russian imperial control uh, before. So, by roughly 1922, 23, 24, one had a new regime in power. One had a set of policies uh, which uh, could be identified with it, which were its recognizable track record. And in 1924, early in the year, uh, there was a formal signing of the so-called Union Treaty. This was a treaty between the various republics, such as Russia and Ukraine and so on, and it's this treaty that constituted the so-called Soviet Union in a legal sense. Now what I want to do in today's lecture is to talk about the 20s. I'm going to backtrack a little bit and start my lecture in 1921 and 1922, and then I'm going to finish it uh, in 1928 which was uh, a year of another transition. It was a year in which a leader that everyone, I think, recognizes, Stalin, had come uh, to full power in the party, and in which uh, he began to institute uh, a new set of revolutionary changes. This brief period between 1921 and the end of 1928 has sometimes been called the golden age of Soviet communism. That's a strange notion. I mean, if you, if you talk to some Russians and you say, now, when was the last good year? I mean, you get all sorts of fanciful a answers. One person said, well, 1903 wasn't bad, you know. <laughs> but you can make a case that even 1903 wasn't so good. Golden ages tend to evaporate before our eyes the more we study them. But the case for seeing the 20s as a golden age is, is this. First of all, it was a moment of cultural vitality and utopian dreams. Now, cultural vitality in this sense. Those people that had identified themselves artistically with the Bolsheviks, with the triumph of the revolution, had for the period of the 20s a kind of free hand to do the kinds of, of art, either plastic art or literary art, uh, that they aspired to do. If we think about Russian painting in the period, it's very interesting. It is a period of competition between the avant-garde, uh, people who were abstract artists, I suppose, uh, in, 
in, in familiar Western terms. Constructivists uh, were a leading school. They uh, took dynamic geometrical shapes and they juxtaposed them on their canvases. The wonderful uh, and interesting period from that point of view, but they competed with more representational kinds of artists, that is, more traditional artists that, whose, whose pictures were somehow humanly and instantly recognizable to people who weren't schooled uh, in any kind of aesthetic school. This was a period in literature in which various groups developed their own school. There was uh, an association, a Russian association of proletarian writers, for example. And these, uh, this, this school took relatively unschooled. Uh, one might, if one wanted to uh, be a put-down artist, say second-rate writers. Uh, and give them an, a publishing house and an audience and uh, to create the kind of art in the interest of the proletariat and, and workers that uh, these people and others in society aspired to create. There were daring, avant-garde sorts of uh, art as well. Uh, this was a time when uh, it was possible to write a piece of fiction set in the city evoking factories, but nevertheless to find the shades of Jung, or may, maybe even perish the word Freud, lurking somewhere below the surface. So there was a cultural vitality in this period. It was a period of utopian dreams. There was the hope that with the state now acting in the interests of the proletariat for the first time and the factories theoretically under control of the workers, that machinery could uh, make uh, the deadening life of, of the worker easier. Difficult, repetitive tasks would be turned over to machines. And workers would continue to work intensely, but maybe not for eight hours a day, maybe only for seven or six hours. And they would enjoy greater abundance. Of course, everyone understood this was not around, right, right around the corner. It would take a long time, but there was the hope that this would happen. Uh, the Georgetown historian Richard Stites has written a very interesting book that is entitled uh, Utopian Dreams about this uh, sensibility in the 20s. Then there was relative peace in, in the 20s. Now, by the end of 1920, early 1921, the Civil War had pretty much been won by the Bolsheviks. There were pockets of resistance here and there, but they were well under control. And uh, these difficult military times of the Civil War and the Great War that preceded it now gave way to peace. People after a long siege that had lasted almost a decade finally could demobilize from the army. They could relax. They could live their civilian lives. So this is a period of relative peace on the international front and relative peace on the domestic front because the incessant campaigns, propaganda campaigns, if you will, of the Civil War period or of the Stalinist period that was to follow these were also not under, underway in the 20s. Now and again, the party tried to do something in a concerted fashion, but uh, there is a sense in which it was possible, if one was sympathetic generally to the revolution, to have a private life and to live peaceably. And finally, this is something we'll be saying a good deal about in a moment, there was an experiment with something that hadn't been tried before. It's something called market socialism, I suppose. Uh, socialists would retain control of most of the economy, but they would permit a small amount of private entrepreneurship and a space in the economy for grain, especially to be marketed, and for peasants to uh, earn income in money for the marketing of this grain. Now because 
of all of these factors, the cultural vitality, the utopian dreams, the relative peace, the market socialism, people have said that this interlude of the 20s uh, can be characterized as the golden age of communism. Or sometimes it's put rather differently. Sometimes it's said that this is a period in which communism developed an alternative face. That the war communism that the party had opted for in the, in the Civil War was gradually abandoned. And what came in its place was a kind of gradualistic communism. A communism in which the party, the Bolshevik party, would retain control, but it would, re it would achieve its socialist goals, its economic and material ends, gradually and with less coercion than had happened during the Civil War. So for these reasons, the 20s are considered a period of great difference. Now, it seems to me that to assess either of these claims, that the 20s is a golden age or that an alternative communism emerged, you have to look at the policies that were adopted, why they were adopted, and how they played out in reality. Let me begin discussing what I call the crisis of 1921-1922 because it seems to me that this crisis is a key component of the background to the adoption of the new economic policy that follows. In the winter of 1920 and the spring of 1921, there was a movement at the Kronstadt Naval Base, it was very close to Petrograd, to the old imperial capital, uh, on the part of the Sailors' Soviet there. Now, you must understand that Kronstadt had been a Bolshevik stronghold. It was part of the first group of areas in Russia to opt for Bolshevism. In fact, the Bolsheviks controlled the Kronstadt Soviet before the, the uh, revolution in October 1917, as in, incidentally, the Latvian Bolsheviks controlled Latvia before then. So Petrograd, Kronstadt, and, and Latvia are sometimes called the Red Triangle because this is the area where the revolution first happened. But because of the lack of democracy in the Civil War, because soldiers and sailors at Kronstadt felt that the interests of the people were not really being served, by the war communist policies adopted in Petrograd, they protested the policies of Lenin's government. They insisted that all power should go to the Soviets, that it should not be centralized in the Bolshevik party, and they insisted on something else. They insisted that elections to the Soviet be democratic in the sense that all socialist parties be represented in them. Now, historians looking at this set of demands of the Kronstadt sailors have characterized this as nothing less than the conscience of the revolution speaking in a clear and unambiguous way to the powers in the Bolshevik party. The response of Lenin was to deputize Trotsky and to send uh, the Red Army on the frozen Baltic Sea out to Kronstadt and to drown the rebellion in blood. And there's actually film of the aftermath of this that uh, has surfaced and uh, been shown since 1991. It's not a very enticing sight, I guarantee you. Another element of the economic crisis and political crisis that faced the party in 21 and 22 was peasant rebellions. Toward the end of the Civil War, in actually a hundred different small localities all over Russia, there were 
anti-Bolshevik peasant uprisings. Now you say to yourself, well, why now? You know, why not earlier? And the answer is that peasants were late to assess that Bolshevik government would not be in their material interest. The Bolsheviks, after all, had come to power by sponsoring land seizure. And so the peasants, who didn't want to collaborate with the whites, certainly, because they feared that the land would be taken away from them, had generally not been anti-Bolshevik during the Civil War period, with some notable exceptions. But now, as they experienced on their skin the full force of the government's food requisitioning policy, its anti-market policy, they rebelled here and there. And the largest of the rebellions was in Tambov province. It was a rebellion that, con that, that called to arms a guerrilla band of about 10,000 peasants. And at one point, they confronted uh, the Bolshevik Red Army troops directly. Poison gas was used against them. It's a terrible thing. Uh, they couldn't beat the Red Army militarily in a direct confrontation, so they took to the forest and to the steppes, and they fought a, a guerrilla campaign. And it took a long time for the uh, Bolsheviks to suppress this uprising. And last, as a component of this crisis, there is the Volga famine of 1921-1922. A famine, hunger, was no stranger uh, to Russia, certainly, and uh, no stranger to the Volga lands. In 1891-92, there had been a famine that cost about 600,000 lives, and it was concentrated mainly in the lower Volga basin. This was an area of dry land farms. It was very dependent on rainfall. When rainfall didn't come at the appropriate times, then crops simply burnt up in the sun. And if there was not surplus grain elsewhere, then people in that area would simply starve. Now, you remember last time when I was talking about war communism, and I mentioned food requisitioning and uh, the destructiveness of the Civil War and the attendant crisis on agriculture. This is the point where those factors come to pinch. During the Civil War period, peasants who were living under red power and who were feeling uh, the problem of food requisitioning planted less grain. And that grain which they raised, they hid so that the authorities from the city, the food brigades, couldn't steal it. So across the country, the stock of food that was uh, raised decreased. There wasn't excess food. Then in 1921 and 1922 in the Volga, one of those periodic climatic uh, problems hit. Uh, crops dried up and there was simply no grain to be given. Now, it's interesting that uh, our Herbert Hoover, who was at that point the most distinguished graduate of the Leland Stan Stanford Junior University, uh, my alma mater, but not yet president of the United States, undertook uh, in connection with the American uh, Relief Association uh, to raise money and to uh, uh, gather foodstuffs to send to the Volga region. And actually, many people were saved from hunger. And yet, by the time that the aid arrived, famine had worked its destructive uh, black magic. There were, uh, the, we, we don't know exactly how many, but uh, in the millions of people uh, who had either starved or who had uh, experienced severe malnutrition. Richard Pipes, the Harvard historian, has called this famine the greatest human disaster in European history until then, other than those caused by war since the Black Death, that is, since uh, the 14th century. So it was a 
very serious crisis. Well, Lenin won the Civil War, but look what he faced. Rebellion from the proletariat at Kronstadt. Rebellion from the peasantry and Tom Boff. He faced famine in the Volga region and the need to authorize foreigners to come in and help relieve the famine. It was obvious to Lenin and other leaders of the Bolshevik party that war communism could not continue as a policy. Something had to be changed. And so in March of 1921, precisely at the time that the party was militarily putting down the Kronstadt Rebellion, militarily putting down the Antonov Rebellion in the Tomboff region, and trying to deal desperately with the beginnings of the Volga famine. Exactly at that time, Lenin announced a departure, a new economic policy. Now what was this new economic policy? It's very important that we understand how Lenin con conceived it and of what it consisted. Lenin conceived this policy not, and I emphasize not, as a permanent policy of the regime. He understood this policy as provisional. He said that what Russia needed after the Civil War was a pirodishka, a breathing space, a time to collect itself. Now the new economic policy consisted in these steps. First of all, in order to restore the production of grain in the countryside. What Lenin did was to say that peasants had to give 10% of their grain in kind to the state. But the other 90% of the grain, peasants could either consume or they could market. And so this guaranteed in his terms that the state would receive enough food to feed the cities, but it also gave the peasants a market stimulus, a reason to produce more. And over a couple of years, this new economic policy in agriculture showed positive effects. So to a certain extent, the problem of uh, agricultural shortfall was dealt with, and you had a market socialism. Now in the cities, Lenin of course said that the big industry, the commanding heights of the economy it was sometimes called, had to be controlled by the party. It had to be owned by the state and the proletariat. However, what you might call the service sector, the small industry that would, would, that would be producing something in the nature of consumer goods, this could be owned by a private entrepreneur. And so you find that under the aegis of the Bolsheviks, this resolutely anti-market party that had just tried to abolish uh, the market and money during the war communist period, saying that businessmen and small businesses can go ahead and form an enterprise and produce for the market. And so in Russia you have NEP men, small businessmen, actually opening businesses. You even have what would have been unheard of a little while earlier, private presses that the government permits to run, although now and again they shut one down exercising their supervision. Now, the new economic policy worked to stabilize the economy, but the cost of it, from the point of view of Lenin and the Bolshevik leadership, was significant. Because it looked for all the world that this was an ideological retreat. Think your way into the position of somebody who has fought in the Red Army during the Civil War. You have seen unspeakable things done to your comrades by the whites. 
and you yourself have done unspeakable things to the class enemy. I won't describe the horrors of the Civil War. Some people, of course, were maimed, permanently maimed, by the Civil War. And for what reason had they fought? Why had they seen all this bloodshed? In order that the proletariat might institute socialism. And now, in 1921, the party backs off from the goal, just as the Civil War is won, and permits businessmen to come back, and permits peasants to enrich themselves. This was, from the point of view of many common soldiers in the Red Army, and from the point of view of the left wing of the Bolshevik party, this was a shocking development. And only Lenin could have pulled off, it seems to me, uh, the continuation of the, the institutionalization and the continuation of the new economic policy. It's like Richard Nixon's the only person that could have opened up China. Vladimir Ilyich Lenin was the only one that could have made the new economic policy stick. But keep in mind his description. It was a temporary policy, a breathing space, and nothing more. Now simultaneously, as Lenin granted with the right hand this concession of the new economic policy, this concession to reality, he also did something that is characteristic of him and of other Bolshevik leaders. He tightened ideological controls on his own party. At the March 1921 party meeting, the same one which adopted the new economic policy, the party adopted the so-called anti-factionalist rule. Now what was this anti-factionalist rule? Of course, Lenin and other party people recognized that when that a party was facing a new situation, that it would have to discuss and debate policy internally. No one quarreled with that. But it was the decision of Lenin and other leaders that once the party established policy, once it formulated the so-called party line, then debate was inappropriate. Any question about a party policy that had been adopted was ipso facto the creation of a faction in the party. And it was punishable by purging from the party, by removing a person from the party and therefore from the center of power in the country. So this was, in our Western terms, a very anti-democratic step. The problem for the party, subsequently, is this. How do you distinguish those questions that can be debated from those that can't be? When do you face the new situation which opens up the possibility for debate? And when are you bound by the rules that you cannot raise any questions about the party policy? Obviously, the gray area here is enormous. And it is this gray area that makes it possible for the leader of the party to say, ah, you opened your mouth at the wrong moment, comrade. You have attempted to form a faction, and you know how this is punishable. This 1921 party decree was an instrument that was used by Stalin later against his opponents in the party. And then we should mention also another development that occurred almost simultaneously. And that was the attempt to uh, suppress opposition of a religious nature. This was the party's war, first a cold war and then kind of a hot war against the Orthodox Church. During the Civil War, there had been very uneasy very tense relations between the church patriarch, a man called Tichon, and the Bolsheviks. 
At first, Tikhon denounced the Bolsheviks and he called for their overthrow. Then when it became clear to him that they weren't going to go away and they might wage war on the church, uh, he held his peace and he shut up. But in 1922, the party thought that the timing was right to bring the issue of the Orthodox Church uh, to a head. It had the instrument or the pretext to bring it to a head in the famine and the Volga. The party demanded that the church do its part in famine relief. Well, this is seemingly a quite reasonable demand. How would this be done? It would be done by a gift from the church to the state of the gold and valuable ecclesiastical uh, vestments and uh, ritual uh, tools. Golden things and silver things would be melted down by the state and sold on the international market for money and then exchanged for grain. So the Orthodox Church was called on to do its part in famine relief basically by desacralizing its blessed vessels, these golden chasubles that were part of the worship service. Now, at this invitation, Tikhon had no choice but to refuse. The state had put him in a box. He said, I'll do anything you want. I've already given authorized uh, private gifts, such as they were, to, to the famine relief. We'll collaborate with famine relief in any way, but we cannot give up consecrated vessels. The party used this refusal as a pretext to bring Tikhon uh, and his liberal allies in the clergy, as we should say his bourgeois or feudal allies even from the point of view of the party, to bring them to trial, to put them under house arrest. And throughout this period, uh, the party conducted propaganda against religion and against the church. This was a period when in Moscow many operating churches were closed and some of them were dynamited. Dynamated for frivolous reasons. For example, Trotsky, when he was a commissar, uh, had a window that looked out on the uh, Kremlin Square, the, the Red Square, and there was a church that was outside of the window that obstructed his view. Well, he demanded that it be dynamited. And so indeed it was. And of course, the most famous of the dynamitings of Russian churches occurred in 1931. This is in the, in the Stalin period, but I cannot help but mention it. This is when the Cathedral of Christ the Savior uh, was blown up. This would be tantamount to blowing up the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople or St. Peter's in Rome. It was a national church. It had been built to celebrate the Russian victory over Napoleon. It had been built and planned for most of the 19th century. It had opened in 1883, and Stalin blew it up uh, in order to make room for an enormous statue of Vladimir Ilyich with his hand raised toward the sky. Well, let us turn from these policies, which were the heart and soul of the 20s, from the point of view of the party, to something that transpired inevitably, and that is the succession crisis. People, even revolutionaries, don't live forever. Vladimir Ilyich Lenin was only 50, 1920, should have lived a long time, but uh, too much fatty food, I guess. He got arterial sclerosis. And in uh, 1922, he began to suffer from a series of debilitating strokes. He had seven of them, I think, in all. And uh, in uh, 1924, uh, he died. He was actually, for the last several months of his life, incapacitated physically by these strokes. And if you look at pictures of him, uh, he was probably uh, 
uh, non-compos mentis during some of this period. Well, in 1922, Lenin felt the intimations of his own mortality. He began to think about succession. Who is going to take the power after I am uh, off of the stage? And what kind of a power will it be? Lenin worried about the men, the few men who were in a position to take power, Stalin, Trotsky, the young party theoretician Bukharin, and a handful of others. But he also worried about the nature of the Soviet bureaucracy. He was very frustrated in 1921 and 1922 because he would issue a decree and nothing would happen. Tolstoy is very good on this, incidentally. Leo Tolstoy in War and Peace, in the second ep epilogue, he says, he says, you know, people who are generals, they think they control the earth, they think they are commanding something to happen, and actually they I issue countless commands, and only a few of them are carried out, and those are the ones that would have happened anyway. So power, Tolstoy says, is an illusion. Well, I don't want to go that far. I'm not a Tolstoyan in this respect, but Vladimir Ilyich felt frustrated, and his frustration had to do with what he saw as the backwardness of the Russians who uh, constituted the bureaucracy. There's endless red tape. His correspondence is full of this word, volokita, red tape. You issue an order a thousand times and nothing happens. And he says that what we have to do is break down these obstacles. And then pretty soon he becomes convinced, well, we'll never break down these obstacles because the problem is Russian culture inherited from the old regime. People are accustomed to the old ways, they don't move fast, and you just can't change them. And he says this is a serious problem. Well, this assessment of the bureaucracy and his pointed assessment of party leaders comprise a group of documents that historians call Lenin's Testament. It's testament because it's a sort of a, a guide, they say, to Lenin's wishes for the future. The most important part of the testament is probably not his protest about the bureaucracy, although some people say, well, you see, he was aware of the problems facing the Soviet government and trying to correct them. No, the most important part of the testament had to do with his assessment of the people that might uh, come to the control of the party. There was Trotsky. Trotsky was a glorious speaker, the finest in the party. It was he who was, uh, on, the, on the behalf of the Military Revolutionary Committee, haranguing the soldiers at the Peter and Paul Fortress in 1917 to surrender the arsenal to the Bolsheviks. Trotsky was, to the end of his life, a brilliant speaker. I, I had a history teacher that once told me he's the only man that he'd, he'd ever known of that could speak to a crowd in French, take a drink of water, and then begin in German, and then take another drink of water and speak in Russian. He was extraordinary, whatever language that he spoke. But he was full of himself. He was arrogant. Because he had been in a position of command in the Red Army, he was extremely abrasive. He was also, and Lenin probably didn't say this, although everyone knew it, he was Jewish. Trotsky had been offered uh, the commissarship of the Ministry of Internal Affairs when the Bolsheviks' first government was put into place, and he had refused it because such a task was too sensitive for a Jew to carry out, he felt. In other words, it would politically backfire on the, on the party. So this was a recognition that there was popular anti-Semitism out there. But the fact is there was also anti-Semitism within the party and at the highest levels. Lenin knew this. He couldn't very well say it. But it's there between the lines of the testament. So Trotsky is the most able person in the party. And yet Lenin doesn't say he's the man that should succeed. Bukharin, well, he's young. He's an able theoretician. 
but Lenin passes him off after a few polite sentences. Then he comes to Comrade Stalin. This is a man who is, in Lenin's opinion, too rude, too uncultured to be the general secretary of the party. Now my question is, how come he's so uh, characterized? I mean, first of all, Lenin appointed him, or permitted his appointment, to the general secretaryship of the party. Stalin was the first person that held this position. Lenin, until 1922, didn't complain so much about Stalin. He permitted him to carry out his task. So why all of a sudden is Vladimir Ilyich upset? He's upset because in his physical incapacity, he realizes for the first time that Stalin may take power after his death. And as he is incapacitated, he has to work on a daily basis with Stalin, and Stalin is isolating him by controlling information by taking literally the doctor's orders that Vladimir Ilyich shouldn't be overstressed. And Stalin is doing things, substantive things, with which Lenin doesn't agree. Some people say, therefore, that when Lenin died, he died a tragic figure, despite the fact that he saw a victorious revolution into effect. He died isolated. He died with the knowledge that probably Stalin or one of these other men whom he had not quite the confidence that he would have wished would come to the head of the party. So the succession crisis began with Lenin's incapacity, and it continued in one form or another until 1928. After Lenin's death, there was jockeying for position. Trotsky, Zinoviev, and Kamenev, who had high positions, Bukharin, all of them made alliances this way and that. First, Trotsky was forced out by an alliance of Stalin, Zinoviev, and Kamenev. Then Stalin aligned himself with Bukharin, got rid of Zinoviev and Kamenev. And then at the end, 1927-28, he turned against Bukharin and pushed him out. So by the end of the 20s, he had a pliable committee. How did Stalin do all of this? What do we know about him? He's from a humble background. He was probably abused in his childhood by his father. He carried out expropriations on the part of the party, that means simply bank robberies in the English language, um, before the revolution. He sat many years in prison. He was a hardened revolutionary. He was very tough. It said that he only loved one person. In fact, he said that, and that was his first wife who died shortly after the revolution. He came to power partly by manipulating the cult of Lenin when Lenin lay in the funeral casket, Stalin gave a speech vowing loyalty to Leninist principles and advertising himself as the most loyal Leninist of all. Stalin permitted the God Builder group in the party to inter Lenin in the mausoleum, in the crystal sarcophagus, all of that. Besides that, Stalin was a master of politics. Already in the early 20s, he was bugging the telephones of his rivals. Already he was assembling the nucleus of what would be his secret police. And Stalin had ideas of his own. He would stand, ultimately, he thought, as a hero of the revolution, no less than Vladimir Ilyich. He believed this mountain eagle, he was sometimes called from Georgia, that it was his historical right to direct the Soviet Union towards its ultimate destiny.